All right. Um, that's enough of all that. Let us get started, uh, but we will open with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for a chance to be together, to fellowship, to have fun, and to study your word. Lord, as we go to your word and as we uh, talk about issues in the culture and in our lives um, and, and what it means to be a Christian in this world, we pray that you'd be teaching us from your word and that you'd be edifying us in that way, but also that you'd be changing us by your Holy Spirit, that you'd be at work within us, making us to be more like Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So we have been studying uh, anthropology or gender and sexuality. What does anthropology mean? That is correct. Um, I'm going to grab a marker real quick. Ah! Couldn't find one. Found one. Starting to think they were with my music stand. All right. Um, we are studying anthropology, which does mean uh, the study of human beings. And specifically, we're doing anthropology from a biblical perspective. So what does the Bible have to say about human beings? Um, what does the Bible have to say about who we are in light of our creator? So we started out talking about the image of God um, and how we are bearing the image of God in male and female. And so that means various different things. Anybody remember any of that? Be So find good role models for biblical manhood, I think, is what you're getting at? Yeah. Yeah, so um, we see the Bible teaching something called complementarianism, uh, which means that there are two genders and that they complement each other, which means that they're essentially equal. They're equal before Christ. They're equal in redemption. They're equal um, in the way that they bear the image of God. Um, and yet they have different roles. They're, they're distinct as male and female. So that has implications for our life and our practice. Um, and for who we are. So we talked about how as image bearers, we are made um, as representatives of God, as reflections of God, but fully dependent upon God. So there's a, a huge difference between the creature and the creator, and yet we reflect who he is in certain kinds of ways. We're also made as spirit and dust. We talked about that, how we are, um, in some ways, we have like a, a, an animal side to us, a, a body side, and we also have a spirit side. Um, but, but these are never meant to be separate. We were created with a uh, body, soul together, and that's how we're going to be in the new creation. So we may be unbodied for a period of time if Christ doesn't come back before we die. Uh, but the, the final goal is embodied souls, and the original good creation was embodied souls, um, which is going to be important for what we talk about today. So we talked about biblical manhood and biblical womanhood coming out of sort of uh, how we're all image bearers. How, do each, how does each gender, um, how do their roles uh, sort of, how are they expressed by the Bible uh, in terms of women having a helping kind of a role and men having um, a headship kind of a role? Does anybody remember anything from biblical manhood and womanhood that, yeah? And what about, the, I get what you're saying. Um, as men and women, as image bearers, we all have vocation. Um, God has given us something to do. We are not just uh, things here that are meaningless or purposeless. We are made for a purpose, just like we're made in the image of the creator. Um, we are given tasks that are sort of in these different categories of king, prophet, and priest. Um, and yeah, those kingship roles originally were like have dominion, multiply, um, rule over the earth. Um, the priestly roles has to do with worship, keeping the garden, which was a precursor of the temple, uh, the tabernacle and the temple. Um, and it really is an image of what the new creation and heaven is going to be like. Um, and yeah, as prophets is to know the word of God, to steward the word of God, proclaim it, um, and, uh, defend it in this day and age. Yeah. JC.org. WPCJC.org. Um, Yes, so we all have those vocations, but depending on uh, whether you're male or female, whether you're a woman or a man, those, that, those categories of vocation are going to be expressed a little bit differently. Anything else from the last few weeks, men and women, that y'all remember stands out to you? I think there's a hand up in the back. Yeah, so there's, there's duty involved with both. Um, men are given specifically a, a headship kind of a role, which involves um, a leadership but it's through service. Um, it's through self-sacrifice. And it's, it's really a leadership that involves bearing responsibility, not just authority. Um, those things have to be together. Otherwise, you have something um, that is 
uh, repressive or tyrannical. Yeah, but the woman has more of a helping role, which really looks like um, support and love and care. We talked about um, in the last couple of weeks. So we're moving from the image of God and the individual expressions of our image bearing in terms of our maleness and our femaleness. And now we're moving more into um, sort of issues that come up around this, um, problems, if you will, and implications. So that was all foundational and important. That's sort of the, the positive teaching of what the Bible has to say about who we are as human beings, um, but also as men and as women. And so this week we're going to be talking about um, gender confusion. And we're also going to, in subsequent weeks, talk about homosexuality. So we're going to treat those differently, and I'll tell you why um, in a minute. But then we're also going to be moving into uh, specifically, like, how do male and female roles, how do they play out in church government? Why do we have um, the rules in our denomination that we have about women preachers and that sort of thing? Um, what does it look like for women to be in ministry in that kind of context? Um, so we're going to be moving into those sort of things. But I wanted to spend enough time on emphasizing uh, our, our image-bearing natures and our specific roles because that's going to really color how we discuss the rest of these things. Um, so today is, I'm calling it gender confusion. We're really talking about um, transgenderism, but it gets a little bit confusing, um, and hence the, the confusion there. So I'm going to start with a few definitions. I'm getting these from Vaughn Roberts because um, I want to draw some distinctions. So you do have um, homosexuality, which we're going to treat in a different category because it really relies on a, a binary understanding of maleness and femaleness. So what we've been setting forth, what I think the Bible teaches, is that there is male and there's female and they're distinct, and those are really the two options, right? Um, that is a binary way of seeing gender. You have two options, that's what binary means. Um, and that binary view is actually necessary to understand homosexuality. How can you be um, a homosexual if there is no such thing as gender, right? Because a homosexual is somebody who is attracted to somebody of the same gender. So if you then say um, there's really no such thing as gender or we can't tie down gender, it starts assaulting w what it really means to be homosexual then. So homosexuality is a serious issue. Um, it's one that's going on in our culture in, in wild kind of ways today, um, but we're going to treat it as, as separately as this topic. Um, so uh, a couple of different definitions here. Transgender, we're treating as different than what we call intersex. Um, this is the definition for that. Intersex is a term used to describe a person who may have the biological attributes of both sexes or whose biological attributes do not fit with the societal assumptions about what constitutes male or female. Intersex people can identify as male, female, or non-binary. So what this is, is, is a very small percentage of the population that has a genetic condition where they're not born um, with clear biological indicators as to which gender they are. So even on the DNA level, um, sometimes it's, it's difficult to determine um, whether somebody who's born intersex is male or female. This is a very, very small percentage of the population. And generally speaking, when a gender is assigned, um, so doctors can do their best to figure out um, which gender the person is. Um, when they're assigned that gender, there's usually no more confusion for those people. So very small subset of society. It's a biological condition, which is why I'm treating it as a totally separate thing than transgenderism. And it's usually not a persistent issue in the person's life in terms of confusion as to their gender. Does that make sense? It's like 0, .0. So first of all, it depends on who you ask. But it's like, Matthew, you're being summoned. Matthew. You're wanted. You're wanted. Already? Um, so it depends on who you ask, but it's something like point, I want to say zero, zero, 008. Um, OK. How about that? <laughs> um, don't, don't, I don't have the figure in front of me, so don't. Um, it's, it's pretty easy to find. I looked up that figure 
earlier this week, and it was on the government website, PubMed. So this isn't like a, a hard statistic to find. There have been people who have thrown out different numbers, as high as almost 2%, um, but they are conflating all sorts of different medical issues to make it artificially look higher. Basically, they are they're taking the definition of intersex and making it include a bunch of things that are not that to make it look like the biological factor is higher than it actually is in the population. <laughs> kind of. Um, and that would be advantageous because um, it, it would sort of legitimize transgenderism in sort of a scientific kind of way in terms of saying, okay, here's, here's this biological factor that's, that's confusing things. So what we're talking about here is not intersex, but just a note on that, um, I don't think that's problematic for our, Jew, our, our view of gender um, because of our view of the way that sin has impacted all of creation. So our understanding of how sin has impacted human beings involves not just our minds, um, not just our bodies, but even our desires, the inclinations of our heart. We're touched in every part by sin. Um, Romans says that all of creation is groaning. We see that all death and destruction, um, all things that are, are evil and corrupt, um, all things that have been marred from goodness, those are all a, re a result of sin that came into the world. They're all a result of the fall. So there are all sorts of biological dysfunctions that we would sort of chalk up to sin, um, including cancer, uh, which is very prevalent. Um, and becoming more prevalent, or we're getting better at finding it, um, we would say that that's something that results from the fall, but isn't the result of anybody's direct sin. Um, so you may not have made an intentional sin choice that led to you having cancer. In fact, I would say that's always the case, um, unless you were doing some sort of sinful activity that led to the conditions under which you grew cancerous cells. Um, so this would fall into that same category um, where there's a biological dysfunction. It's the result of general sin in the world. It's not the result of any individual conscious sin. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? Thoughts on that? Okay, so I wanted to distinguish that um, right out of the gate. So we're not really talking about homosexuality here. We're not really talking about intersex. What we're talking about is transgenderism. Um, so there are all sorts of different kinds of terms, um, but trans or transgender, here the definition, definition is an umbrella term to describe people whose gender is not the same as or does not sit comfortably with the sex they were assigned at birth. Trans people may describe themselves using one or more of a wide variety of terms, including but not limited to transgender, cross-dresser, non-binary, genderqueer, um, which would be GQ. So, we're really talking about the T and some of the pluses in the LGBTQ plus um, things. Any, any questions about all of that? So there are other terms that kind of go along with this, but for the purposes of our discussion, um, I, I wanted to distinguish homosexuality, intersex, and transgender or any kind of gender confusion. So non-binary would fall under this where um, instead of saying, I'm a man trapped in a woman's body or vice versa. I have no clearly defined gender, um, but it's different than the biological sex that I have. Does that make sense? Well, <laughs> does what? <laughs> did you understand what I said? Well, no. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. Any questions so far? All right. So, um, as we talk about this, I, I want to start with um, some of the sort of major ideas that have pervaded our culture. So every generation, there are sort of differences in what is going to be the major sin this decade or these three decades. Um, and this kind of changes from century to century as well. As uh, culture changes and as history progresses, technology advances, um, every generation, their worldview can be fairly different. So I'm a big fan of history. I've often thought, what would it actually be like to be psychologically like a raider from the Mongolian steppe in the year 900, following Genghis Khan? This, that kind of person 
would have an entirely different worldview than you. Um, apparently, when the Mongolian hordes left the steppes um, and took over the entire world, a lot of them, their clothes were actually sewn out of field mice skins. So these are people who had been leading harsh lives on the steppes, um, no idea about Christianity probably, um, believing in sort of spirit deities from various parts of nature, catching tons of mice to clothe yourself, um, and then going and literally wiping out entire cities. The, the frame of mind that that person has, the, the world view that that person has, would be entirely foreign to yours today. So it could be kind of hard to um, understand everything that that person was thinking. And there might even be a little bit of a difficulty in communication, not just because of the language um, or the time period, but because of um, the ideas that are ingrained in sort of that way of life at that time. What's interesting about the Bible is that it presents a, a whole view of the world. We call it a worldview because it's a view of the world. And what's really cool about the, the comprehensive nature of this is it has an anthropology. It has a view of what human beings are. It has an understanding of who God is. It, it's a story about what he's been doing uh, in redemptive history, in all of history. Um, so it has a, a morality that it gives to you. It, it shows you purpose and meaning. And that worldview is communicated through generations. So as Christians, our worldview in very significant ways is tied um, through the millennia with other Christians. But almost always, the Christian worldview is mostly or completely countercultural to whatever the cultural milieu is in which it exists. So if you kind of think of it, we have like a, a, a line of descent of the biblical worldview through time, but it's existing in and amongst what's happening in the world. The reason I say all of this is because we have to understand the basic beliefs that are leading to the possibility of the level of gender confusion that we have in our culture today. As Christians, it's part of our job is understanding the, the poisonous ideas of culture that we are up against so that we can deal with them in our own lives because we are, to some degree or another, a product of the culture that we are in. Now, we're being conformed to the image of Christ, and we should be renewed in our minds, um, but the culture that we are in gets into us, and we have to be fighting against that. But also, to be confronting these ideas and culture, we have to understand sort of what's lying below them. Carl Truman wrote a book, um, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, which I don't know if I recommend it to you. It's a very thick book. I do recommend it, but um, I don't know if it's something you're going to... It's not light reading. I'll say that. Yeah. It is with a C. Um, but this is how he opens the book. He says, the, orig the origins of this book lie in my curiosity about how and why a particular statement has come to be regarded as coherent and meaningful. Quote, I am a woman trapped in a man's body. Oh. End quote. <laughs> <laughs> it's a book really about um, the modern self, how in our modern day and age, how people are coming up with a concept of self, a concept of personal identity, and, and what are some of the philosophies that have brought us to a place where what was even 30 years ago something that would have sounded like nonsense, um, which is, I'm a woman trapped in a man's body, is today the opposite of that. Not only is that not nonsense to say in our culture, but it's something that if you deny it, the majority of our culture would say that you have some sort of moral flaw for not acknowledging that that is possible or coherent or makes sense. Um, it's, it's something that is widely accepted and is, is sort of taken as uh, universally true or taken for granted, if you will, in a lot of circles. So how does that go from being something that probably 30 years ago wouldn't make sense if you went on the Mongolian steppe and tried to talk to um, one of Genghis Khan's warriors about it, he would not understand you because you're speaking English. Um, but even if you could communicate, he would be like, what are you talking about? Um, to now, it is basically taken for granted truth. Um, and there are a few different things that I think are primarily leading to it, or at least Truman does. Um, but what he does is he discusses the difference uh, first between a social theory and the social 
imaginary is what it's called. So we have different theories that sort of run through the current of our culture. And most people can't articulate the full extent of those theories. If you're like, hey, what's your worldview? Most people will be like, what's that? Um, unless they've thought about it, um, unless they've um, really evaluated for themselves what their systems of thought are, and they've looked into the philosophies that they believe. Um, but most people do adhere to certain kinds of philosophies or theoretical traditions. Um, so there's lots of people that agree with, say, critical race theory, but they may not be able to articulate to you what exactly that is. They simply um, believe that the, the ideas are true. So that's the difference between um, a, a social theory and a social imaginary, is when the ideas of a theory seep into sort of the fabric of the culture, and they're, they're ideas that everybody takes for granted. That's when they're on the not imaginary level, but in the imaginations of the collective people, um, the spirit of the age, if you will. Can you clarify that? Yes. So the social theory is like if you took um, Marxism, that's a social theory. Um, but if you took some of the ideas from Marxism and you took them out of the theory, say um, a society became so saturated with Marxist ideas um, that everybody started believing that there should be equal outcomes and not just equal opportunities. Um, so if you said everybody should have the same amount of money in a society, that might be a Marxist idea, and they may believe that even though they don't understand the Marxist philosophy. Does that make sense? So the theory would be the systemized philosophical belief system. The social imaginary is our collective conscience, if you will, soaking up um, the ideas of theories that are being put forward in sort of various, or believing the ideas but not being able to articulate the social theory. Is that what you said? Does that make sense? Yes. So, <clears throat> okay. This is important to understand because the social imaginary um, is intentionally influenced and it's especially influential to young people, which is why in this day and age, um, we're having a huge influx of especially young people who are having gender confusion. Um, this is for a various, uh, for a variety of reasons, for a various of reasons. So whenever people talk about young people, it sounds pedantic. You guys know what pedantic means? That makes it even more pedantic, unfortunately. I, I'm not going to spell it. It sounds like talking down to, like, the young people today, or you kids. I don't want that to sound like this. <laughs> yeah, this isn't like a, when I was your age. There's something, though, about being a young person, being um, of teenage ages, being between, I don't know, 15 and your early 20s, where you are especially susceptible to the social imaginary because you're not so old that you are stuck in your ways and curmudgeon -y, and you're not so young that you don't know what's going on. You're actually more tapped into the social imaginary than most people because you have more imagination. Um, but part of what's going on is that you are at a time when you are building a worldview and you are building a personal identity. Because you are self-conscious, you're no longer just sort of running around and you don't know exactly what's happening and you're not self-aware. You are self-aware. You're, you're adults in many ways, but you're not yet um, to the place where you have cemented who you're going to be for your whole lives. Um, so you are hopefully intentionally shaping worldview, intentionally shaping identity. Um, so not only are you, do you tend to be, just because of your age, more tapped into the social imaginary, but you're actually actively, hopefully, or passively taking on a worldview and taking on an identity. Um, because that's the phase of life that you're in. That's not a judgment statement. That's actually a really cool thing. And if you realize that about yourself, then you can take more control of it. You can be intentional about the way that um, you're being shaped and that you're shaping yourself. Um, I say all of this partly because you are more likely than old people to be impacted by the kinds of ideas that we're talking about. Um, but also because the sins of this generation are more likely to be the sins that you guys struggle with 
over people who are more established in their worldview and more established in their identity. Um, the older generations have their pet sins. The generations after will have their pet sins. But as likely as not, you guys are going to be more impacted by either the gender confusion, um, the, the sexual issues uh, in the myriad sexual issues that are out there, um, but also the ideas that lie underneath those that have to do with the way that we shape our personal identity, those ideas that uh, Truman talks about in his book. So part of this I say as a warning to you um, to be aware of it, because if you're aware of it, you can deal with it. Part of it I say um, as a way of saying you should not allow any sins that you're struggling with to be kept secret. Sin wants to hide. Shame is the tool of the enemy. Um, I will not be surprised, and hopefully the, the other adults in your life will not be surprised if you tell us that you are struggling with some sort of um, sin that involves gender confusion um, or homosexuality or pornography. Um, I was once in a gathering of people, part of a church, and somebody was talking about the need for us to have um, a conference or something about pornography. And somebody stood up and said, we don't need anything like that here. We don't struggle with things like that. Right. <clears throat> and it wasn't, well, we don't want that to be us. There is no sin that we should say that's not a danger to us. Now, everybody's going to have things that they struggle with more than other people. Um, every generation's going to have something they struggle with more than other generations. Um, but I just want to say this to sort of let you all know, I know you have friends who deal with this. I know you may be struggling with this or things like this. Um, it's not something to keep hidden. It's something to deal with. Um, and what we're doing here is not saying anybody who has some sort of sin struggle that we talk about in here is out of the club. Um, it's actually the opposite. We are all sinners here for grace. Um, but we want to be clear about what the Bible says, and we want to be clear about um, how the Bible teaches us that we're to be conformed to the image of Christ rather than the images that we have in our own minds. So here are some of the things that I think are, are or I should say Truman thinks, are uh, underlying all of this gender confusion. So one of them is that identity comes from within one's... Now that probably doesn't sound that crazy to you. That's because... This is the going idea in our culture. Um, it, it's very much a fabric of what we're swimming in. Um, that was a mixture of metaphors, and it didn't really work out. The fabric of what we're swimming in. It's very much part of the stew in which we're swimming. And you don't want to be swimming in a stew because it's being cooked. I don't know. Are we boiling the broth? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I went down a weird metaphorical journey there. So identity coming from within yourself, um, and, and along with this is that your identity is self-assigned and realized. So you are going to be self-actualized based on the psychological conditions within yourself. Um, so that means the impressions that you have, the way that you feel, um, what you are thinking, you then take to be part of your identity. Now this has been mostly foreign through most of time. Um, it's just something that we very much have here in the West, coming from various philosophical traditions. Um, even Descartes, I think, therefore I am, is sort of the part of the beginning of the, rational, uh, the rationalist expedition into the psychological self. So I'm not trying to like, be down on Descartes, and I think his argument was actually pretty good, but it points to a psychological truth being part of the foundation for one's personal existence, um, including who one is. So identity coming from within, you are defined by who you think you are um, and by what you feel and your psychological condition. So psychology should be up here. The psych. Another one, um, identity, personal identity, doesn't need to agree with any external objective truth. Um, we'll just say subjective. Now, you may say, okay, if you're defining yourself internally, then of course it's subjective. Well, yes, but then whoever you are internally has to deal with the real world. Um, this is where, say, if you had this psychological, psychological condition of thinking you were a woman, but there was a biological reality of you being a man, these two things would no longer line up. Um, the second one is saying that if there's an external reality that disagrees with the internal reality, the internal reality always wins which is problematic because you're dealing with reality. So 
the, the internal identity is subjective, so there's no outside source that can conflict with your internal reality um, because your internal reality is reality. Okay, number three, um, individual identity requires external validation. Now, hold on, you might say. Does that not conflict with what you just said? It kind of does. Um, what? Does that, that makes sense. That was me checking, that was me checking my internal psychological condition with some objective checks, um, and it checked out. So, <laughs> this one has to do with the idea that, okay, so you are an individual, you, you are defining your internal reality, uh, your internal reality cannot be refuted by something external. However, we are all things that exist in groups and part of being an individual um, or having self-consciousness is being recognized by other self-consciousnesses. Um, this is a Hegelian idea, an idea that comes from Hegel. Um, it comes from other places, but these two things, um, they do line up as long as everything externally validating you lines up with your subjective reality. So what you need is, if these things are true, the culture you're in to agree with whatever your subjective reality is. But if your foundation for your, your truth of who you are is subjective and is coming from within, then any failure from the outside to validate internal conditions is not a problem with you, it's a problem with everything else. Um, so I wanna read you an excerpt from The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self um, explaining this. So Hegel begins the most famous section of the phenomenology of the spirit on the relationship between master and slave with the following statement. Self-consciousness exists in and for itself when and by the fact that it so exists for another, that is, it exists only in being acknowledged. Welcome to German philosophy. What Hegel means by that is that the self-consciousness is, is found only in fully developed form where two such self-consciousness recognize each other as mutually recognizing each other. That's a rather convoluted and inelegant way of saying that a human being is most self-conscious when she knows that other people are acknowledging her as self-conscious being. So, she or he. Um, so, further on and further down and further up, he says, what it implies is that, uh, what this means is that society itself is an ethical community. What it implies is that the individual finds her self-consciousness or his, for you guys out there, sorry, in being recognized by the society. It's funny how outraged you guys are that they didn't say he. Um, Anyway, easy, um, finds that her self-consciousness in being recognized by that society, and this occurs because she's behaving according to the conventions of that society. In short, there's a need for the expressive individual to be at one with the expressive community. Uh, Carl Truman. Hegel wrote the, the quote, and then he expounded. It's, it's very, um, sometimes it depends on like the, the philosophical tradition that somebody comes out of, the like the mother language of that tradition. So sometimes it has to do with that. Sometimes. All right, guys. Um, this this week is not about the patriarchy. Um, we can revisit it. Um, okay, I still have a couple of minutes. Um, we'll probably do this one in a two-parter. I want to make sure that there's time for discussion. Um, so, okay. So the, these three basic ideas, um, they're underlying kind of what's going on in the gender confusion. So these three things are pervading society. And in their formal terms, it, it may not sound like it, um, but the identity coming from within, at least for me, uh, that doesn't sound crazy at all. Like, go and find yourself. Um, uh, of course, you're going to know yourself best, right? Um, you know, you need to find out who you are. You're still figuring that out, um, which can be true. Introspection is important. You should be molding an identity. 
Um, but the question is, do you find that within yourself or without yourself? Um, a lot of times in ancient secular societies, your identity was given to you by an external hierarchy. You were born into a certain kind of station. Um, you were defined by a certain group of people that you were born into. In Christianity, um, we are defined by our creator, right? And we're defined by um, who he's making us into be. Um, we're defined by the group known as the church. We're the body of Christ. Um, so we have an external sort of um, identity. So you may need to find out who you are, but you're not going to find out who you are from within yourself. Um, these other ones, they're definitely out there. I mean, we can see this one working itself out in the way that um, the people with sort of a gender confusion ideology see it um, as an imperative that the whole culture then adopt those same ideas. Um, but you see this in other areas too, where um, any sort of internal reality needs to be recognized by other people. Um, uh, there's, there's no separation of somebody's idea from who they actually are internally. And who they are can't be refuted by anything outside of them. And who they are is going to be determined by what they feel and what they think. Um, which, which makes this an especially difficult thing to deal with as Christians, um, especially as we're dealing with uh, people who are outside of the church. Because in this frame of mind, with this worldview, um, these ideas that are underlying the gender confusion, if you say something like, we love the sinner, but we hate the sin, what would be problematic with that, given these ideas? Right, because what we're calling the sin is the fact that they are saying they're a different gender than their biological sex, which we see as separate from who they actually are, because we see them as image bearers of God. Um, but they're having their internal identity defined as um, who they think they are, and it can't be refuted externally, and it must be validated externally. So a rejection of um, the ideas that somebody has about who they are is a rejection of them wholesale as a person. Um, so it, it makes it difficult to then approach them with different ideas, because the ideas are, are fundamentally opposed to who they are. Um, why might this be important to understand as we address the issue of transgenderism, for instance? Why would we need to know this? Know how to argue with them? Sure. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I think you're going to really understand what's happening more if you know these underlying ideas. It's not just that they're confused about their gender and believe all of the same things about identity that you do um, if you're a Christian. It's not that they um, have the same view of what a human being is even. Um, but, but rather they have a, a radically different view of what a human being is, um, not just in sort of the downstream things like how should you treat me in terms of my pronouns, but even fundamentally as in what sort of a thing I am and how that is defined. What were you going to say? Sure. Well, you may not really be able to talk to the issue um, if you don't know that this is, it's not just an idea to somebody who believes these things, it's actually who they are. So you have to start with essentially basic biblical anthropology. You can't start with saying the Bible says you shouldn't be transgender um, or the Bible speaks against sexual immorality in these areas because that's like five, level, five levels removed from the conversation in their mind. Um, what you're really saying is that you are somebody who can't come to God if you say that. If, if you understand that you have to start at the basics, what you're really dealing with is a, an apologetic kind of situation, um, almost as if you were dealing with a whole other culture. Like if you were going to try to explain what the Bible says about human beings to a Mongolian steppe raider from 900 AD, you would do it differently than if you were talking to somebody who basically believed the same things as you. Um, if, if you accept these fundamental truths, you're, you're on a whole different footing than Genesis 1, which is what everything else grows out of. So to be able to deal with this sin issue in somebody who's not a Christian, um, you need to start there, really. And in speaking with somebody who is dealing with this and they are a believer, what we have to do is bring them back to some of the basic realities about what God says about human beings in general as well. Um, so I'm out of time, but we haven't gotten to Scripture yet. Turn over to Romans 12. Um, we're going to be picking up with... Next week, what I want to deal with is 
because apparently I, today was just a long introduction. Um, what we're going to do next week is deal with this in two parts. Basically, the, the theological and the philosophical issue. So there is a sense in which we are in a cultural war, one worldview against another worldview. But there's another sense in which this is a pastoral or a relational concern in that um, this isn't just a war of ideas. Um, there are people, and there are immortal people who are either uh, facing an eternity joined with God or an eternity separated from him, and we are on the side of people and because <laughs> we can separate um, the sin from the sinner. So we want to look at not just, okay, here's what the Bible says, um, here's how, uh, here's the problems with transgenderism or what the Bible says about uh, the way that we should be unconfused about gender, but we also want to talk about, okay, how do you practically um, deal with somebody who's struggling with this? Um, how do you deal with somebody who is not a believer, who is coming from this uh, really entirely different worldview? So those are going to be the two sections. Looking in Romans chapter 12, um, starting in verse 1, um, I'm going to read all the way to verse 21 because we often take Romans 12, 1 through 2 as sort of its own thing, but it's really not. There, there's a lot of things that are happening there. Um, this is coming out of talking about how the Gentiles were grafted in, um, God's people in terms of Israel, and then he turns to uh, chapter 12. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Let us use them, if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who bless you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome evil. Do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good. Um, right after this is a whole section on submitting to authorities, which is distasteful to, I think, all people, um, but especially people who come from an individualistic society like ours. Now, that was a long section of Scripture, but I want you to see he starts out with saying, okay, your bodies, you, you are a sacrifice. You are to be laying down yourselves. How do you do that? By being renewed in your mind, by being conformed to Christ. And then what comes after that is an exposition of what that's going to look like. And first, he talks about how you are in one body with all of these other people. So you need to be using your gifts for that body um, in a self-sacrificial kind of way, in a way in which you're being conformed to the image of Christ, which means being renewed out of your own selfish self who is not, by default, going to give of themselves to a body of believers. Um, you need to be overcome in that. You need to be renewed in that. Then he talks about all of these other things. Um, abhorring what is evil and holding fast to what is good. Pretty easy, right? Um, now love everybody. Show honor to everybody. Be fervent in spirit. Um, 
Don't hate your enemies, but love your enemies. Pray for those who are persecuting you. Um, all of these things are commands for you to be giving up of your own selfishness, of your own sin natures in all of these different areas, um, whether it's anger or sexual immorality or just general selfishness or haughtiness. There's a call to be humble here. Um, this is saying, okay, all of you Christians, what you're being called to do is being reformed from who you were in sin into who you are currently in Christ. That the identity that you have been given is that you have been brought into the new humanity with the new Adam. This is going to be true of everybody. No matter what the sin struggle is, we should be finding our identity. We should be filtering our desires and our thoughts, um, everything that is internal to us, against the objective standard of what God says in his word. Because he knows what is good. This is the original sin, right? Is that we know what is best for ourselves. Um, we see that the fruit is desirous to be eaten. And so we decide God must not know what is best. God must not be good and have my best interest at heart. So I'll follow my own way. This is the fundamental sin of humankind. And that's what we're being called by Romans 12 to be renewed out of. Conform to the image of Christ. Conform to um, understanding that we are image bearers of God first. And now in the new humanity, new humanity image bearers of Christ. Um, and the call there is to sacrifice our own desire and our own will to what Christ has for us. And if that is not difficult for you, then you're not doing it right. And you may not be aware of the sin that you need to be um, strangling out of your life right now. For some people, it's going to be um, this transgender confusion that's um, taken hold of them. For some people, it's going to be a variety of other sexual sins. For some people, it's going to be anger um, or, like I said, just regular selfishness. Um, but we're all called to be struggling against those sins, not being, uh, using our own standard to measure who we are, but using a standard that God has given to us. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word that it is true and that it can teach us about who we are. And we pray that you'd help us to lean into the fact that we are all dead in our sins, but that we have been saved by grace, that we have been given the gift of faith so that we can be saved through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Please help us to live out of the reality of what he has done for us out of gratitude and help us to be uh, gracious to the people around us, but to be speaking the truth confidently um, to all that can hear. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.